Hello, everyone. Uh, as long as my mic and the internet works here, I just want to welcome you all. My name is Jeremy Fioravanti. I'm the president of the Delaware County Institute of Science. Um, we are continuing with our Zoom uh, lecture series, which is no small feat uh, for our organization. It's the second year we've been doing it. We were founded in 1833. Um, I want to encourage you to get involved. You'll probably be receiving a letter from me in the next several weeks. Uh, so please uh, make an appointment, come by the Institute, get involved and help out. I'd like to thank Dr. Gurdon and Dr. King for managing the technological aspects of this lecture, as well as Dr. Kimberly Wood for agreeing to come and speak to us this evening. So uh, without further ado, Dr. G, would you please introduce our speaker? Thank you, Jeremiah. And I am so excited to bring to you uh, a dynamic person I met a few years ago through the American Geophysical Union, and she is quite the science communicator, quite the scientist, and we are in for a treat tonight. So Dr. Kim Wood is an assistant professor in the Department of Geosciences at Mississippi State University, specializing in tropical meteorology. She obtained her PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Arizona. Dr. Wood has published and presented on research that includes land impacts of tropical cyclones in the eastern North Pacific Basin, extratropical transition of tropical cyclones, satellite-derived estimates of tropical cyclone genesis and intensity, and quantification of environmental factors that affect tropical cyclone structure and intensity. She is currently pursuing research related to tropical climatology, land impacts of tropical cyclones, and tropical extratropical interaction events. I cannot think of someone more qualified <laughs> to give us a talk on these tropical cyclones, specifically the ones from the North Atlantic Basin. So Dr. Wood, I'm gonna go ahead and turn over this Zoom room to you. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to virtually be here with you all tonight and to share a little bit about what happened in the North Atlantic this past year and give you some insight into how I do my research. So before I dive into this, I do wanna highlight that occasionally on some of these slides, you're gonna see some weird looking words that most of you may not have seen before. They are names of Python packages. Python is a programming language that I use to do much of my research and to create the graphics that I will be showing you tonight. So for example, this is a satellite image of cloud top temperatures that are inferred by a instrument out in space looking down at the earth, taking a snapshot every 10 minutes of this full view of one side of the earth. And we are able to access those data pretty readily these days using the Python programming language, which has a perk, it's free. And there's a ton of resources out there to help you learn it should that be of interest. So I just wanted to point that out that there's a few little tidbits scattered throughout this talk that highlight how I do what I do and what I'm showing you. On this particular snapshot, this is from when Hurricane Ida made landfall in Louisiana unfortunately on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina making landfall in Louisiana. The 29th of August, Katrina was 2005, Ida was 2021. But in this snapshot, we see that there's uh, multiple things going on. We have Julian out here in the middle of the North Atlantic, and then this out here labeled 10L, which is future Kate. So it has not yet been named, it has not yet become a tropical cyclone, but it soon will, not too long after this image was taken. So just to give some context for what average activity is like in the North Atlantic, and we did just complete well, I guess not just, but last year, 2020, ended another 30-year period that NOAA uses to create their 30-year climate normals. So on average, over the preceding 30 years of 1991 to 2020, the Atlantic generates 14 named storms, seven hurricanes. This is a category one through five. So anything that reaches the minimum to be a hurricane counts in this number. And then on average, there's three major hurricanes, which is a category three or higher. So just for context, this is what the average is being used now, calculated from activity observed from 1991 to 2020. To make sure we're all on the same page, since I don't come here expecting everyone to be a tropical cyclone 
expert, I will often use these terms interchangeably. I will refer to hurricanes and I will refer to tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclone is the generic name for hurricanes, typhoons, tropical storms. It refers to the type of weather system involved. And the type of weather system is depicted here in this diagram, where this is looking at a cross section through it. So all this swirly kinds of stuff up here, that's the top that we see looking down from space. And then underneath that, which is called the outflow cloud shield, you will have these spiral rain bands. And then in the center, that's where the eye will form, that clear eye. And the surrounding that eye is where the deepest thunderstorms are, the really, really tall clouds. That is where you find the eye wall and usually the strongest winds. Uh, tropical cyclones are categorized according to the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. Note that it is a wind scale, so this is all about the maximum sustained winds found generally near the center. So that would be the eye wall right here. And the names that they get called comes from what their maximum wind speed is, going from tropical depression to tropical storm, and then the five categories of hurricane, with category five being the strongest, anything with maximum sustained winds above 156 miles per hour is categorized as a category five. I want to highlight a couple things here. You'll often hear numbers bandied about in the media and online when there's a tropical cyclone that's active out there. When we talk about how strong a storm is, it has to be averaged over a minute. So, you know, if a storm comes through your area and you hear really strong winds howling through the trees, those are usually caused by gusts. And gusts are very short term, you know, one to three seconds. So if you average the wind speed when it was gusting and slowing down and gusting and slowing down over a minute, that's where you get the maximum wind speed from. So when you hear about the really strong winds that get measured by you know, an oil rig that's out in the Gulf of Mexico or by a station that's on the coast as a storm makes landfall, often those numbers are gusts rather than the maximum one minute sustained winds. And so the number will often be higher than whatever the National Hurricane Center is saying that the storm strength is. Also, this scale is specific to wind. It doesn't account for how big the storm is, and it doesn't account for how fast or slow it's moving. Fortunately, we've seen a lot of slow moving storms in the past couple of years, such as Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Sally. And the slower they move, the longer they impact an area, and often the worse the flooding gets because they keep raining over the same spot. So when we categorize storms according to this scale, it's not capturing those other elements of the hurricane, especially when it comes to impacts. So looking at the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season, I developed this graphic to highlight how the season evolved over time. So this is categorized according to that Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale that I just outlined with the colors corresponding to how strong the storm was, <coughs> excuse me, how strong the storm was, what category it belonged to, and note that sometimes you get labels of subtropical. That's when things are a little funny when it comes to the system and how it forms and its structure. So it's not quite tropical, but it's kind of getting there. And the NHC advises on both tropical and subtropical systems. So this timeline with time on the x-axis and the storm from earlier in the season to later in the season going down here on the y-axis is highlighting when storms occurred and how strong they were and how long they were in those different categories. So we see here that Anna started things off before the official start of the hurricane season, which is marked here by the dashed line showing June 1st. June 1st through November 30th is the official hurricane season, but more and more often lately, we're getting these quote unquote pre-season storms. And research has shown, including a project I worked on, that perhaps the official bounds of the hurricane season need to get a little longer to better encapsulate when activity occurs because we've been seeing more and more storms getting named early in the season and even before the season officially starts. Then we had a period of, you know, back-to-back -back storms, none of them getting too strong. They're, you know, the blues and the greens here showing tropical depression, tropical storm strength. And then we had Elsa, 
which became a hurricane, weakened again, became a hurricane again, and then made landfall. And then oh, we had a break. And then there wasn't a break for a long time. We were getting kind of worried that this was going to be another 2020 with the rapid pace of the season. But where the storms occurred and how strong they got was a little different in 2021 versus 2020. So of course, we're going to compare things to 2020 in this presentation. Um, but before I get there, I just want to highlight that there were 21 named storms. Remember that the average was 14, seven hurricanes, same as the average, and then four major hurricanes, which was one higher than the average. So we had a lot of named storms. We went through the whole alphabet as far as the name list goes, all the way to W, uh, but we didn't end up using any of the alternate names from the backup naming list. I do want to point out that a season may be below, above, right at average activity, but it just takes one to make a season really bad for a community or location. And unfortunately, we did have that occur with Hurricane Ida, which hit a state that got hit way too many times last year in 2020. So I'm highlighting a lot of statistics here for comparison, for context, but it really just takes one storm, which is what we tend to push in messaging each year as folks who are in uh, areas at risk for hurricanes prepare for the next hurricane season. So by comparison, yeah, uh, 2020 was a little busier. This is the exact same graphics, same scale. We just have more storms. Uh, down here, Wilfred, that's where we exhausted the name list. And then we had all of these Greek letters. We don't use Greek letters anymore. Last year is the last time that they will be used to name any storm in the North Atlantic. The World Meteorological Organization now uses a group chosen uh, backup naming list if the official list ends up exhausted again in the future. So 2020 was very active compared to that 30 year average, 30 named storms, 13 hurricanes and six major hurricanes. So double to more than double uh, most of those categories. So it was very, very busy. Some of the storms were strong for a long time and it, it definitely broke records in many ways, unfortunately. Another metric that you might have heard of is this concept called accumulated cyclone energy, which here on out, I'm going to call ACE. And ACE is a metric that tries to capture the intensity and duration of a storm. So if a storm, it gets really strong, that will accumulate more energy. If it lasts a long time, that will accumulate more energy. So if there happens to be a storm that gets really strong and lasts a long time, that's really gonna rack up what we call the ACE. So it's another way to try to capture not just number of storms, but how long did each storm last? How strong did each storm get? And that's something else we use to evaluate how active a given season is and try to compare what storms did to factors such as the ocean temperatures, the moisture in the air, that sort of thing, so that we can continue to learn more about them and thus warn people about what kind of activity to expect. So in 2021, this is what all the activity looked like, all 21 named storms. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes I drop little hints about the tools that I use in Python to make this map possible. So we're again, highlighting where they were, by how strong they were, what type of storm they were at those locations. So we see here a couple long-lived storms. We have Larry here, a long-lived major hurricane, a long period of time here at the red, and same for Hurricane Sam, also a very long period of time at major hurricane strength. If we look farther west, we find Ida, which formed in the Caribbean, and then took a pretty straight shot into the Gulf, rapidly intensified in the Gulf and made landfall around peak intensity. I mentioned ACE on the previous slide. And uh, this is how ACE breaks down by month with green being what happened in 2021 and black being the 30 year average for comparison. So you see most months it was about normal to maybe slightly below normal in November. 
but a little bit above normal in August and a bit above normal in September. So this highlights that a lot of the activity that pushed 2021 past what is average in a given season happened in the months of August and September, which lines up with climatology. We see that on average, September is the busiest month in the North Atlantic. If we then break down by uh, storm, we see that Sam and Larry combined contributed nearly 60, 60 percent of the whole ACE for the season. So because we had these two long-lived storms that I pointed out, they, since they got strong and were long-lived, they produced a lot of ACE. Then as we get down to these smaller and smaller slices of the pie, that's where the rest of them contribute. So there were quite a few storms that weren't that strong and or were short-lived. And so that contributed to us going through the naming list. So our technology has gotten better, our understanding of these storms has improved, and so we're better able to capture actual tropical and subtropical activity by naming storms when we notice them during the season, and that tends to lead to using up more names. Now, looking at it month to month kind of breaks things down. The August and September were the most active, and August, or October was about average. But we can also break down by day. So we see here in the green that there were a lot of there was this spike here in early July, pretty much Elsa, and we get spikes in the latter half of August, which is largely dominated by Ida. We get these peaks here, partly contributed by Larry, and this really big spike here, that would be Sam. And then nothing. Nice and quiet for much of October, which was so needed after last year when October broke some records. We got one last storm, Wanda, wandering around in the North Atlantic, and then the season ended. Went out with a whimper, we were totally happy with that. By comparison, uh, 2020 was kind of busy. <laughs> this is the same size map that just has nine more storms on it. And you see here, if we toggle back and forth, if it lets me, there we go that the Gulf and the Caribbean in 2021 had some storms, but compared to 2020, far, far more activity in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. And as you can see, there's a lot of land there. So by having so much more activity in those locations, it increased the risk that land would be affected by those storms. So we were really grateful to see lower activity in 2021, particularly in those locations, compared to 2020. And again, breaking down the same things that I showed on the previous slide, ACE was kind of normal up through August. Even into September, though we were naming storm after storm, a lot of them were short-lived. It was October and November that really boosted 2020 above average. And these particular months were way above average. October was about double, and November was almost six times as active as usual, thanks to Ada and Iota. So about 150% of normal ACE was produced in 2020. Uh, the distribution was a lot more even across way too many storms compared to what we saw in 2021. And just a ton of these green spikes later in the season we had a lot of activity, a lot of storms in September, but we just had strong storm after strong storm going into October and November. So 2020 really stood out from other seasons in part because of how active the late part of the season was. And we actually got a paper accepted earlier this year that talks about why 2020's latter part of the season ended up being so active. So I wanna get into a little bit about the different storms that made 2021 so impactful. And this is an animation of cloud top temperatures taken from geostationary satellite imagery following the storm. So this follows Ida as it rapidly intensifies in the Gulf of Mexico. And the black circle indicates a constant distance. So you can see how the storm gets bigger and how it gets more symmetric and then more asymmetric here at the end so that it's easier to identify how the storm is changing with changing intensity. So 
Started out, of course, as a tropical storm when it first got named, became a hurricane about 24 hours later. And then not quite 24 hours after that, it rapidly intensified. And rapid intensification is something we've worked very hard to improve our forecasting of because of the hazards that it can cause and the difficulty in forecasting it. Ida was a very good forecast and it's, it speaks to the talent of our forecasters and the tools and science that has advanced over the past few decades and all the work that's gone into it to be able to forecast these events days uh, ahead of time. As I noted on the very first slide, it made landfall on the 29th of August, which is the same date as Katrina 16 years earlier. So of course, there's gonna be comparisons between Ida and Katrina. So I made these maps to highlight some of the similarities and differences between Ida's size, structure, and location when it made landfall and Katrina's size, structure, and location when it made landfall. So the colors mean the same thing between the two pictures. As we get into these black to almost white colors, those highlight very, very cold cloud tops and taller clouds reach higher in the atmosphere. So that implies deep, deep convection when the cloud tops are really cold. So we see a larger eye in Katrina. We see, you know, they each have some kind of lopsided appearance to them, but overall Katrina is much bigger because Katrina went through something called an eyewall replacement cycle before it made landfall. And when that happens, the storm tends to get larger. So because the storm got bigger, its wind field got bigger and it pushed more water on shore, contributing to the absolutely devastating record-breaking surge associated with Katrina's landfall. Ida did cause storm surge, but not to the extent of Katrina, in part due to the differences in how big they were and the direction they took in making landfall. So there's a lot to compare between the storms for similarities, you know, both major hurricanes, that sort of thing. But there's also a lot of differences, a lot of nuances that help explain why their impacts were different. But satellites are not the only tool that we have to watch these storms make landfall. We can also look at radar. So this is an animation of radar imagery where you're sending out a signal and seeing what comes back to highlight some of the structural evolutionary changes going on in these storms as they make landfall and also highlighting the slow movement of Ida as it traversed land. So we see the eye wall coming in. We see some rain bands here as the yellows and oranges pop out some concentric eye walls that kind of look like cylinders surrounding each other. And then it just keeps that structure for so long moving inland because it was moving slowly because the area was very moist and because it still had a feed of energy coming from the part of the storm that was still over water. So scientifically absolutely fascinating, but horrendous to watch this unfold because you know there are people there who are experiencing this or people who have evacuated and know that their homes are still there in the path of these hazards. So these are tools that we can use to watch and learn about these storms, but they also can tell us about some of the things that are happening there in real time affecting people so that we can continue issuing advisories and warnings for those who may not have been able to evacuate. I also will use satellite imagery to look at before and after. So these are true color images from satellites that orbit a lot closer to the Earth so they can get this kind of imagery. And you too can look at it yourself if you'd like to by accessing the NASA Worldview website. So this is from August 22nd, before Ida made landfall. We see, you know, there's some clouds there, so you can't quite see all the land surface, but we've got some clear blue water out here. We've got all these different areas of, you know, brown and green. You see the Lake, Lake Poncho train out here, Mobile Bay over here, you know, looks pretty good. And then we look at what happened on September 10th, which is afterward. So some of it looks similar and some of it looks not so similar. So let's highlight this region right here. So this is before. So again, we see here's the coastline right there. And after, there's huge changes in what the water looks like and even what some of the vegetation looks like. So on land, the winds and the storm surge and the rain would have severely damaged vegetation. 
and homes. But also after the storm moves on, the runoff is going to push all kinds of things like dirt and silt into the water, changing how that appears. So the appearance of the water here, north of New Orleans, even Mobile Bay looks quite different from before versus after. So that's showing some of the impacts that are still being seen from space. September 10th, this is more than a week after Ida made landfall. There were also damage surveys conducted to highlight what some of these areas looked like afterward. And this is a house that's just completely destroyed, ripped off of its foundation near the coast of Louisiana. It's visible from these NOAA planes, these survey planes that fly over an area afterward to assess it. And you see all these kind of weird spiky looking things. Those are trees that have been completely stripped of their leaves. So the, this highlights just the force that is in those winds uh, when a strong hurricane like Ida makes landfall. So it's really important to keep in mind what the on the ground experience is like in the wake of these storms. We study them to try to learn more about them, but we also study them to communicate what those impacts can be like and ways that we can consider making changes in the future so that should another one make landfall, which Louisiana knows could happen, uh, we could potentially be better equipped to handle those impacts. So this is from a Washington Post article that highlighted where power was still out 12 days after Hurricane Ida. Now, I live down here in Mississippi. I know what late August, early September weather is like. It's hot and it's muggy. And not having power means it's very hard to cool off because it's, it's really, really humid and you don't have power for air conditioning. So to be without power for 12 days and just see all this kind of wreckage still around, it's this is what a category four hurricane can do at landfall, even in a country as advanced as the United States. So it's important to think that it's about how you know, it's not just the storm when it hits, but also that long lived aftermath. And this doesn't even touch on the impacts that were felt in the Northeast, where the remnants of Ida dumped so much rain that you know, the New York subway was completely flooded. Like the, the impacts they had from getting three inches of rain in less than an hour, it just, it's hard to wrap your mind around. And that Ida's impacts were felt across almost half of the United States. So there's these impacts that happen at landfall and then there's these impacts that can happen well inland. So part of the reason that Ida caused all this damage was because it was able to intensify really quickly when it reached the Gulf of Mexico, underwent rapid intensification, which we saw coming. We just didn't think it would be quite as bad as it was. Like, you know, there were signs that it could be, but the, the fact that the NHC even explicitly forecasts rapid intensification shows how far our skills have come. So a big contributor to this was the warm water. SST stands for sea surface temperature. So this is the temperature of the water right at the top of the ocean. And anything above 79 degrees Fahrenheit, that's pretty conducive to tropical cyclones. So the fact that water was ooh, 86, 87 degrees ahead of the storm. So this was on or August 28th, the track that the storm followed. And then this is the expected track that the NHC was forecasting to highlight the path that it subsequently took over these warm waters. And one of the contributors to the water being warm is something called the Gulf of Mexico loop current. It cut off piling up all of this warm water in one space. And unfortunately that was right along the track that Ida ended up following. So there's plenty of warm water in this region. And so the next question is, how unusual is it? Uh, so we can also look at that in part thanks to data available from NOAA and through tools like Python. So this is looking at the anomalies. If it, they're red shades, that means it's warmer than normal. If they're blue shades, that means it's cooler than normal. 
And this is comparing to the 91 to 2020 average. So ahead of the storm, the SSTs weren't necessarily super warm compared to the latest 30 year normal. But normal does depend on the averaging period we use to compute that normal. So if we look farther back in time, say 1971 to the year 2000, that was a bit more above normal. So that is an indicator that depending on which averaging period we use, the anomalies may look worse or less worse. And it also highlights that things are getting warmer in the Gulf of Mexico as time goes on. Now, that's not the only way we can get information about what the ocean is doing. We can also get information from what they call autonomous robots. I love the fact that I get some data from robots that just float out there. And every 10 days, they take a profile. So they're just floating out there. They drop down. And then every 10 days, they take measurements as they ascend to the surface. So we get information about how salty the water is called salinity. We get information about how warm the water is. And then once it reaches the top, it sends its information to a satellite, which then takes that and puts it in a database for researchers like me to access later. And I can look at these in near real time. These get reported on a pretty frequent basis. And so I was able to look at these profiles of ocean information for Hurricane Ida, and I did not like what I saw. So right here, that, that part of the x-axis is that 79 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 and a half degrees Celsius. We're all the way over here in the 87, 88 degree Fahrenheit range or 30, 31 degrees Celsius range. And that water is really, really deep. So you have to go down to 40 meters, which is on the order of 120 feet before you get to water that is below 30 degrees in a lot of these locations. So the colored dots indicate where these profiles were taken. And the forecast cone here shows where the NHC expected Ida to go. And their track forecasts were really, really precise for this storm. So when warm water is really deep, the churning of the water as the strong winds of the hurricane move over it, that tends to bring water up from below. And if the water that comes up from below is also really warm, that's gonna keep feeding energy to the storm. So Ida had a ton of energy to tap into and that contributed to how quickly it intensified once it reached the Gulf of Mexico. Now, I, Ida was not the only tropical cyclone to hit the US in 2021. It was one of nine. Uh, some of them you might not remember because they weren't quite as impressive or newsworthy as Ida. We had Claudette back in June. Uh, Elsa, that made landfall in July. Fred, that was in August. Of course, we had Ida. We had Mindy, which actually formed really quickly and made landfall not long after forming uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And then we had Nicholas, which is a hurricane when it made landfall, though it doesn't look as impressive on satellite compared to Hurricane Ida. Now, these six all made landfall in the Gulf of Mexico. There were three others, Danny, Henri, and Larry, that hit land um, outside along the Atlantic, US, and uh, Canadian coast. But the Gulf of Mexico needs a break, like especially after last year. Like If we could get no landfalling storms in 2022, 22, yeah, that would be great. That would just be fantastic. Uh, but there were also some interesting storms that didn't hit land. Hurricane Sam was the longest lived one. It was the one that contributed the most to the seasonal ace. And it also rapidly intensified, but out well away from land. So here on the left is a similar type of animation showing satellite imagery as the storm rapidly intensifies. And here on the right shows how the storm, its intensity changed. So here the S, the green is tropical storm. The H here in orange is for a category one hurricane, and the M here in red is for a major hurricane, a category three. Note that all the units here are in knots. That's the unit of measurement that the NHC uses to record intensities. And a knot is one nautical mile per hour, which is about 1.15 miles per hour. So it's miles per hour is always gonna be a bit higher than the number you see in knots. 
So this animation highlights that, you know, the storm is kind of trying to get its act together, pulsing a lot of convection, those deep, tall clouds. And then once that got organized, there went its intensity and that eye starts to emerge. Uh, but we don't just have to look at cloud top temperature. We can also look at visible imagery. This is the kind of image you would see if you were out in space looking down on Hurricane Sam. And Hurricane Sam was a major hurricane for a long time, about eight days. That's a really, really long time to ma maintain a major hurricane intensity. So I made this animation that captured seven of those eight days, looking at how the storm is kind of similar and kind of different each morning around sunrise. So each of these days, it set a slightly different intensity, went through some eyewall replacement cycles. So its structure changed a bit over that time. It changed latitude. The size also evolved. But you know, it's just morning after morning after morning. We wake up, we see that we still have a major hurricane out in the Atlantic. And we're very grateful that this ended up not being a devastating storm. Because when you have a long-lived storm like that, if it gets close to land, that increases the number of places that could be negatively impacted. Hurricane Irma was an unfortunate example of a strong, long-lived hurricane that impacted tons of communities in the Caribbean and, of course, in Florida and up the U.S. coast as it managed to maintain that strong intensity and also impact so many places. And Irma was in 2017. So we've been dealing with really strong storms impacting parts of uh, inhabited areas in the North Atlantic for quite a few years now. So what are some of the things that kind of explain what we saw in 2021 versus 2020? They both were above average, but 2021 was not the same ridiculous caliber that 2020 was. So in these maps, we're looking at anomalies of sea surface temperature. So remember, as sea surface temperature goes up, there's more energy available to the storm. We're looking at the average from August to October, which, as we saw, were the three most active months on average per season. And so where you see the green shades means that it's better for tropical cyclones. Here for SST, that means the water's warmer. And if you start to see the pink colors, that means it's not as good for tropical cyclones. So, and if it's white, that means it's just average. So it's pretty close to normal for the 91 to 2020 period. And, you know, they're kind of similar. We've got some above average temperatures off the US Atlantic coast and here at high latitudes in both years. But one of the differences is how the Caribbean seems to be just a little bit warmer than average across much of it in 2020 compared to 2021. And remember, when we looked at those two maps of the two seasons where the storms were, their tracks, there was not so much activity in these areas in 2021, but there was quite a bit in 2020. So SSTs being just a little bit above average likely contributed to the activity that we saw in 2020 compared to what we saw in 2021. Another factor that contributes to whether we get tropical cyclones and how strong they can get is moisture. So hurricanes like humid air, more moisture in the air. They're the deep clouds, those tall thunderstorms that power them. They're more likely to persist and get stronger. And in 2020, things were about average and possibly a little above average in the Caribbean and the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. Whereas in 2021, we had this big region out here, just a little bit drier than normal air, which possibly contributed to not having quite so many storms develop and persist in this part of the basin. And as we saw in 2020, if they can make it to the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico, they're much more likely to impact land. So it's possible that this blob of relatively dry air compared to normal out in the middle of the Atlantic at low latitudes where storms tend to form and intensify might have prevented 2021 from being quite so active compared to 2020. And finally, there's this thing called wind shear. So this is a change in winds with height, either in direction or in speed. And if you get a lot of change in winds with height, then you're gonna take those tall clouds and tilt them. 
And hurricanes don't like to be tilted. They want to be nice and stacked to be as efficient as possible in taking the energy they're getting from the ocean surface and converting it into powering those clouds and speeding up their winds. And so for shear, we have a lot of better than normal shear in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. I'm starting to sound like a broken record at this point. Whereas those same locations here in 2021, either about normal or maybe a little bit worse than normal. So again, some changes in the environment of these storms on average probably contributed to the activity we saw in 2021 compared to 2020. So just to do a quick review of 2021, compare our 1991-2020 average to 2021, we had many more named storms than normal, but about normal hurricanes, and one more compared to normal uh, major hurricane. So when we look back at that ACE metric, it's about 120%, so 20% higher than normal uh, for this 30-year average in 2021, so it was an above average season. Uh, we break it down by month. Most of that above average activity was in September with a bit of a boost in August as well, in part thanks to Hurricane Ida. And again, it just takes one really bad storm to make it a bad season. And we did have one of those in the form of Hurricane Ida. The uh, latest estimate I could find of overall damage from the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season was 70 billion. Uh, and most of that was unfortunately from Ida, both in Louisiana where it made landfall and then the damage that its remnants caused in the Northeast. So we saw by looking at those maps that 2020 was hyperactive because conditions were very good for TCs on the whole, but 2021 was pretty active too. We didn't see a whole lot of the pinks to help suppress activity. It was more that things were pretty normal compared to the past 30 years. And that kind of helps explain where we saw activity and the strength of the storms that did occur. So a natural next question you might ask is, will future seasons also be busy? 2020 broke so many records. 2021 was also above average. Is this a new trend that we're just stuck with? And this map here is showing the a single value of sea surface temperature, it's called an isotherm. So a constant line of temperature is known as an isotherm. And they're color coded based on the year. So if we look at the August to October average, uh, back in the early 80s, with the more pale blue colors, those, uh, the isotherm for about 83 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 and a half degrees Celsius, a little bit farther from the coast. And then as we get to more recent years, that warmer water on average is getting closer and closer to the coast. And so that is a likely contributor to seeing storms like Laura, Delta, Ida, these storms that are rapidly intensifying as they approach land because they've got this source of energy right below them because warmer water is closer to the coast. But this alone does not guarantee that we will continue to see really busy seasons because Sea surface temperatures are just one of the many components that go into whether a storm will form in the first place and then what it will do after it develops. So yes, the ocean is getting warmer, but the atmosphere is also getting warmer and it's not evenly getting warmer. So trying to say, yes, we're just gonna be in busier and busier seasons is very hard to do right now because the answer is complicated and there's a lot of research going into trying to identify what factors are gonna to contribute to activity as we move into the future. Now, I did at the beginning mention uh, that I like sharing not just what I do, but how I get there. And so for anyone interested in learning a little bit more about the tools behind the scenes that I use with Python, this QR code will take you to this web page that I've developed that highlights the different packages in the programming language Python that I use and all of the yellow words here are links to get more information about those different tools. I also have links to some example code that I've written to share with the community to highlight how I personally make some of these happen. So if you go to that page, there's a navigation list that if you click on useful Python packages, it will take you to what you see here. 
So I do want to acknowledge that a lot of my work wouldn't be possible without Python and the different funding sources that I've been lucky to receive, such as from the National Science Foundation and from Unidata. There's a lot of great resources out there like NASA Worldview, a ton of freely available data that you can access through Python or, or otherwise. Um, the Amazon Web Services bucket from for NOAA data is how I access imagery. And I want to thank you guys again for your time, for being here to listen to me on a fine Monday evening, and would be happy to take questions. We'll give you a sec to catch your breath, Dr. Wood, but thank you so much for all of this amazing information you have shared with us. This is it's exciting and devastating and scary all at the same time, but but wow. Um, I want to remind everyone that you can put your questions in the Q&A box. Please do get those in there. I have some also that have been submitted earlier. So Dr. Wood, if you're ready, um, I can go ahead and uh, send one question your way. You talked about hurricanes forming over the ocean as well as the hurricanes that form over the ocean and then hit land. What if a hurricane like Sam forms over the ocean and stays over the ocean? What kind of impact does it have on the ocean? Or do we know? Oh, that is an excellent question. So as I mentioned earlier, when I showed those vertical profiles of temperature that are taken by those Argo float robots, um, when a storm moves over water, it's churning up uh, the water at the top. And because that's getting moved out of the way, well, nature can't stand a vacuum. So water comes up from below to replace it. So you get this thing called upwelling coming into play that's bringing water from lower levels up to the surface that wouldn't have been brought up otherwise. And that will change the distribution of temperature, of saltiness. And in places that are very biologically active, that can change the distribution of phytoplankton, of algae, of that, all that sort of thing, as well as the um, you know, concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water and that sort of thing. So all this overturning caused by a churning hurricane moving overhead will affect what's going on in, for the ocean in that location. But there's actually some really distant effects that can happen with hurricanes that never themselves move over land, but can change the motion of the ocean thousands of miles away. And that's in the form of increasing rip currents. Uh, so when a large storm like Hurricane Sam is over the ocean, all that churned up water, well, that has a cascading effect and that will increase the chance of rip currents along shores um, within that basin. And unfortunately, when there are rip currents, that increases the likelihood of accidents and fatalities. Even though the storm itself, nowhere near land, they can still cause terrible impacts to those who may be just going out for a day on the beach. Uh, so it's really important when there's a hurricane out there to still pay very close attention if you're on the beach to anything the lifeguards might be saying, you know, the types of flags that are out, and you know, maybe watch a NOAA video on how to identify a rip current before you go out and play in the water because those storms can have really negative impacts very far away. There's uh, you know, folks in, our, in the scientific community that we've lost because of rip currents. And so it's a very real, very deadly hazard. And we always hope to not have those kinds of things happen every year. And we will be putting on our lecture series webpage, by the way, these links that you have provided for us, everything from the NASA worldview to your Python <laughs> coding and tutorials. So uh, we'll also put on something about rip currents then for people to go back and look at. So thank you for mentioning those. Um, you did mention you like playing with robots and getting data with robots too. And sail drones have made an appearance this year and have been pretty popular. Is, is that something that can give us more information also about what's happening in the ocean or on the ocean? Yes, uh, if we had unlimited money, there would be so many sail drones out there because they are one of the few uh, platforms that can give us ocean information and air information. And I mentioned that the energy for a hurricane comes from the ocean, but there's so many intricacies about how exactly that energy goes from being in the ocean to being in the air and then that air touching the ocean actually getting into the storm. Um, it's called air-sea interactions, and then the change of energy moving around is called energy flux. 
And there's uh, so many cool projects out there that could take advantage of this. Um, we have a new professor in our department who is on the oceanography side of things and has done a lot of work with this exact kind of phenomenon and would love to get more data from sail drones. So they're really expensive and not easy to deploy, but we're hoping that you know, we might be able to get more data from them to better understand what is actually happening at these really small scales so that we can take what we learn, make our models better. And by making the models better, then when we don't have those observations, we have a better guess as to what might be happening in their absence and have an idea of, okay, what are the parts of the model that are doing well that we want to keep? And what are the products of the model that aren't doing so well that you're like, oh, let's, let's see if we can change that so that next year's forecasts are better. I want to go to a question in Q&A. Um, can hurricanes ever get disconnected from wind flow and stand still? Oh, um, yes, uh, with caveats. So the, um, it's not the best analogy, but to first order, you can kind of picture a hurricane like a cork in a stream, except the cork's spinning really hard and messing up the stream too. <laughs> so well, the, the flow of the air is what we call steering flow, and that's guiding the storm. But in a case like Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Sally, sometimes one side of the storm, it's flowing one way, and the other side of the storm is flowing the other way, and they kind of negate each other. So the storm just sort of stays in place. Um, and when that happens, when the storm doesn't really move, then it just keeps raining and blowing its strong winds over the same place. Um, I don't know if you've ever had, you know, 40 plus mile an hour winds hit your house, but they're kind of loud. And so imagine when it's like 70 mile an hour winds and it's for a day. Now, 70 mile an hour winds, that's what you might feel if you're driving down the freeway and you stick your arm out the window. Guess what? 70 mile an hour winds, that's a tropical storm. You have to get to 75 to be a hurricane. So tropical storm force winds are nothing to sneeze at. And if they last for a long time, that can be as devastating to power lines, infrastructure, that sort of thing, especially if it's been raining a lot and the soil's getting loose and now your power poles are more likely to get blown over, or trees are more likely to get uprooted. And so we watch really carefully for when the steering currents or the steering flow starts to relax, or they might even call it collapsing. Um, and so if there's ever a, out, uh, an update from the NHC that says a storm is nearly stationary, if it's anywhere close to land, that is bad news. I mean, it's not great at any time, but when it's close to land, that's just gonna persist in its impacts. And Hurricane Dorian was an unfortunate example of that where hurricane force winds ravaged the Bahamas for days because the storm just hit at peak intensity as a category five and just about stalled right over the Bahamas because the steering flow got so weak. That's fascinating, thank you. Uh, another question, how much damage occurs to the seabed during or after a hurricane? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, it depends on how shallow the water is. Uh, so we saw some of that um, disturbance of silt, both from runoff, but also likely disturbed from that shallow shelf coming up to meet the coastline from those NASA worldview images. Um, but it's partly dependent on how quickly the storm moves. And the, it really depends on the slope of the ocean floor and the depth of the water coming up to that coastline. So there's a pretty shallow, large shelf uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, right up to the shore. And so there's going to be different impacts on that seabed compared to, you know, a really deep area off of that continental shelf. And there's some forecasting challenges that come with that because it's hard to know if a storm is necessarily going to end up churning up water from the seabed versus not quite getting down there. And that can change the amount of energy available to the storm because now it's pulling in water from the side instead of just pulling it directly upward. And there's been a decent amount of research going into that too. So a scientist will take instruments and on ships and go explore like after a storm passes, what is the, what's the water like? What's the seabed like? 
Um, can be hard to get out there right away, but some interesting findings have come from that. I'm not as familiar with that aspect since I'm not an oceanographer, but I do know there's work going on in that area. So I'll just give you one additional uh, ocean question that just popped in here. Is there any evidence of larger sea creatures sustaining injuries when the storms are over the open ocean or do they just go along for a ride? My, my hope is they do the ocean equivalent of hanging out in the eye if they could. Um, but the, the impacts, especially if the water is deep, they'd be able to kind of go under it. Um, most creatures are going to be able to go to depths that would get out of the way of some of the worst churning. Um, you know, if you ever like jump into the water, if you're snorkeling or something, if you're in the wake of a, a boat, you'll see like really, really choppy water right at the surface. And then it kind of calms down fairly quickly as, as you get depth. Um, so like in the moment, it's not super battering, but I can imagine it being pretty uh, gnarly if a storm's been out there for a while. I get seasick, so I couldn't watch the sail drone footage for very long, but there were like 45 foot waves. Um, and I imagine that even a sea creature hanging out in that would probably think twice about riding those waves for too long. Um, so I haven't heard any like direct evidence of injuries. I imagine it's possible, but they are probably better able to dodge it than we might as humans who don't have the same abilities to swim underwater. Thank you. Let's Talk a little bit maybe about the, the length of, the, of hurricane season. So as you showed in your graph, certainly at the beginning, you know, June 1st is the official start of how we define in a textbook hurricane season, right? And it goes to November 30th. But as you pointed out that these storms occur even earlier or can occur even later. So do we need to redefine our hurricane season? Because even thinking back to you know, 1992, when Hurricane Andrew hit, that was the letter A, the first named storm, and that hit in August. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have an A until August of that year, and yet this year the A came significantly sooner. So why do we stick to saying hurricane season is June 1st to November 30th if we know it forms outside of this, this time? So the, as far as we could tell, there wasn't really a solid scientific reason for picking those dates. They just kind of got picked and that was kept. Um, there's a lot of decisions that were made, you know, decades ago that we don't necessarily have records of why they were made. And so we have to sort of either guess or fill in the gaps to try to figure it out or just conduct some scientific analyses to come up with reasoning for why we might pick a certain range of dates. And our perspective on why it might be better to have the hurricane season officially start a little earlier uh, is really twofold. One is that these early season storms seem to be more likely to impact land. And so if you start the season officially sooner, then people might be are prompted to prepare a little sooner. But you know, if something happens May 20th and they're like, oh, I had till Memorial Day weekend to finish my prep and oh, wait, no, it's already here. You know, it's just, it's partly a messaging thing. Um, but also the National Hurricane Center started issuing the routine updates on just tropical conditions May 15th now. So the official start of the hurricane season hasn't changed, but the NHC uh, procedures have now started earlier because they're aware that there's these increasing chances of stuff possibly happening before June 1st. And in the Eastern North Pacific, the season starts May 15th. So there might be a change at some point, but the NHC is also very careful to do their due diligence before they change things because they are the trusted entity for this kind of information. And so when they do make a change, they wanna do it right. So behind the scenes, there's probably a lot of things going on that you might not see in the public view because they wanna make sure it's as vetted and useful throughout their networks for you know, their end users, the public, yes, but also for emergency managers, for FEMA, for other government entities, you know, city government, state government, and of course, the National Weather Service. Uh, so there's a lot of coordination that goes on behind the scenes to try to disseminate information. And so they're going to be in contact with these people to make sure any changes they make will work once they're implemented. Um, they're also incorporating more social scientists to make sure that how they message and what they're considering is in line with what we know about how people interpret information and what 
helps them take the best possible actions to protect themselves and their families. Well, I will say for us in the greater Philadelphia area, we are paying attention certainly to some of that messaging. Uh, the remnants of Ida came right through our area, mid-Atlantic, and caused some of the highest flooding ever recorded in Philadelphia region as well. So. Uh, so we're also watching and paying attention to some of that too. Um, one last question just popped in. And so if you don't mind, we'll just ask this one last one about hurricanes in the South Atlantic. Can those happen? Oh, yes, I love these questions. So most basins produce tropical cyclones. Uh, the rare outliers are on either side of South America. They, at least that we know of, don't happen in the Pacific Ocean. So on the west side of South America. And they happen very rarely in the South Atlantic. So I didn't go through what we call the ingredients for how tropical cyclones form, but they need that warm water, they need moisture, they need low wind shear, uh, they need to be some distance from the equator to help them spin, thanks to the Coriolis effect. Uh, the air needs to be able to rise, so it's called instability when air can just rise. And then they need a something to get them started. We call them seed disturbances, like the waves that come off of Africa. And the South Atlantic doesn't have a whole lot of that. They don't have a lot of the disturbances that help things happen. They, the South Atlantic tends to have a lot of shear, some dry air, and the sea surface temperatures generally aren't there. So in general, you don't get them, but we've, we've seen a few of them in the past decade or so. Um, Katarina in 2004? I think was like the first one that got named in the South Atlantic. And then there was Anita in 2010. I hope I got those right. I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, so they're rare, but not impossible. And uh, Brazil is in charge of naming and advising on them. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Wood, thank you so much for this fascinating overview of what happened this past season, what's happened in the past seasons as well, and uh, given us a lot to think about and look forward to as the next season <laughs> will certainly be coming along. Um, and just a note to, to our audience in the chat, you'll see a link to the, to the website where we will post a recording of this lecture. We'll post uh, this amazing collection of links that Dr. Wood has provided for us. And you'll also see where you can now register for our next uh, lecture, which is taking place on January 10th at 7.30 to 8.30. Um, that is going to be talking about mathematical devices at the Smithsonian, an insider's view. So for those of you that are fans of science history uh, and want to get an inside look behind the scenes at the Smithsonian, uh, we encourage you to sign up for that lecture. So thank you again, Dr. Wood and Jeremiah. I'll turn it over to you for the final comments. Sure, as long as my internet holds up, just thank you, Dr. Wood. I, I know you're going to an international workshop next, <laughs> another digital engagement you have. So good luck with that.